give back a lecture saying, oh, in national interest, it's important, I remain quiet and I love the ruling. They would say, are you in politics or are you wanting to sit at home? So you will have various different views and you have to carefully balance to make sure the truth of the matter is expressed without, of course, sensationalizing and looking at temporary gains that you can get. But it is a very difficult balancing act. So the moment I'm remaining quiet, my supporters might feel I've lost one opportunity. The moment I speak, they'll always be young, very idealistic mind like yours, which will tell, ha, BJP is failing politics even in national security. Both are true, both are unavoidable. Nirmala, I have a question. Uh, on your answer to the first question, what happens to then the statement, Caesar's wife should be above reproach, applied to the context of politicians? Um, even that is an issue on which, if for instance the opposition says to the ruling party, Caesar's wife, you have to be above suspicion and therefore you quit your position, they would say, oh, what did happen in your time? Yes, even we should stand up to that measure. But the point is, if I have to apply that to every one of those who have been, let us say, charged, then the party will also appear as being vindictive. Now, there are times, I would say, people uh, who come from, you know, very, very uh, deprived backgrounds, and if in case there's a charge against them, and immediately if you expect the idealistic position of there is a charge, please quit, it will also be seen as, oh, you're ready to impose it because he's from a deprived section. There are very, very fine balancing act for which a political party will have to be responsible and uh, respond uh, keeping all the realities in mind. That's not to say that we have to keep supporting somebody who has been convicted. No. But at the state, stage of allegations, one has to be extremely careful not to jump to a conclusion much before the courts prove it. It's oh, very good evening, ma'am. Um, ma'am, uh, I'm Priyansi and I'm from PGP1. Ma'am, my question is, um, I've always heard that good politicians are born. So can they be created, like engineering and management, can there be institutes where uh, children take up politics and to become a good politician as their career? Much before I answer, I also want to ask you a question. How do you know when a good politician is born? Is there going to be a star? Is, is there going to be an announcement? We usually hear that, yes, that person has done so and so and he's really good and he's put in so That's much effort for the society. after he becomes 30, 40, society. something like that. But yeah? ma'am, you just said right now that there has never been a dearth of good politicians. Absolutely. So, of course, there have been good politicians and in that context, I have heard that good politicians are born. So. That's exactly I have, uh, where I have a difficulty because do you know that there is a good politician born as and when he is born or do you know when he is 30, 40 and he has already <laughs> contributed? So yeah, uh, these are very euphemistic way of saying, you know, uh, politician is born which means you are excluding a whole lot of us who are trying to be good politicians. <laughs> I wasn't born a politician. So um, no, I know what you are trying to get at, you know, the point is Inherently, if you have qualities which can reach out to people, which can understand the issues with which people are unable to resolve and live, e there is a politician there. So ma'am, uh, individuals like us who might not be having inherent qualities can never become politicians. No, you don't know. You might, you're probably one who was born to be a good politician, but wait. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, my name is Sahil Anand. I'm from. Uh, good evening, ma'am. My. Good evening. <laughs> I thought yeah. you were not listening to me. Oh no no! I'm all yes. <laughs> Sorry. My name is Sahil Anand. I'm from PGP One. I just want to stress upon the relevance of the topic. Like uh, we watch politicians watching some salacious videos in Parliament. We watch politicians saying uh, various things like rapes are being committed in India, not in Bharat. So, I want to just say that, is, it, uh, is this something wrong with us people who perceive this of politicians? 
or somewhere down the line the brand of political system in our country has been created such a like such a uh, pathetic condition for the politician from by the politician i just want to, as being a management student i just want to know how the brand of political system is being created i already told you that we are always paint painted very badly no but see I think the difficulty arises each time for a politician when uh, the, uh, a cynical definition or a appraisal is done because we expect politician to be performing as though he is not part of this society. Ideally, it should be. It should be an exemplar performance. Therefore, each one of us can look up to them and say, wow, yes, this is how a politician should be. I wish every one of us match up to that. But to expect as though they live not in this society, which has everything in it. I don't want to use the words good, bad, whatever, but relative goodness, relative badness, relative everything prevails. After all, the politician comes from this. He is going to reflect these qualities. So, I'm glad you expect the moment somebody steps into politics to be great guy, clean guy, very good guy. So were the women. But the moment they enter the politics or the arena of politics, you expect them to be that. But after all, they've grown in this whole, you know, muddle. So they will be the presence of all kinds of people in a political party. They have their own sense, they have their own relative uh, performance in the grassroots level. They, they may be very, very understanding leaders as regards the discomfort of you know, the common people. They may take up very big causes, but they may be perceived as something very different. And it is not going to be possible for us to correct that perception overnight. So to expect that, I, I go back to the example of sciences, lawyers, doctors, every field, to expect only in politics that kind of complete 100% purity may be unrealistic. After all, all of us are drawn from the society, the society in which all of us live. I may have a fantastic neighbor right side of my house who is very caring, very understanding, very, very cooperative lives his life, pays his taxes, doesn't beat his wife. But the fellow next door to the left could just be doing everything opposite. Can I wish away this neighbor? No, you have to have, you have to live there, you, you have to see how best you can sort that household if you can, without intruding into their privacy and everything else. So, I want to disabuse the minds which tell me that political parties will have to be completely clean, completely you know, pure. Yes, that's the ideal stage, which all of us will love to reach. But as of at any point in time, there will always be all kinds of people. So that's the reality. What if such a politician is your role model and your dreams of becoming a politician are being completely shattered by such an incident? So like I look uh, on Mahatma Gandhi as my role model. If he has committed such, if he would have committed such a thing, so my dreams of becoming a politician would have been shattered. No, I think... Uh, I might not look politics as my uh, thing. No, no, I, I, I clearly see where you're coming from. And in that, that is where I think it's important to understand. Uh, I wouldn't want to say my philosophy is better than somebody else's philosophy. All philosophies are equally contributive to society, strengthening their minds and so on, or the collective thinking. But certainly Indian philosophy, which underlines taking the median path, you know, not looking at extreme situations, not looking at somebody as being completely good and somebody as being completely bad. Every individual has goodness and not so goodness in them. When he is able to balance the two and the goodness side gets revealed, it's better. And therefore, even in my uh, political ideal or uh, the idol who I look up to, if there are weaknesses, I need to ignore that and look at only those which are good for me to get inspired by. And it is not the fault of the idol to be true to himself. 
It is for us who are looking for excuses to say my idol himself has become, uh, uh, sorry for want of many a, a better expression I am using, uh, it is our fault if I say my idol has become a rogue and therefore, oh, that party where he is, is useless, is also an extreme position to take which may not be fine. We have to recognize that in every human being you have good and bad, it is for us to look at the goodness in that person and see if that is making a big contribution to the nation building rather than look for excuse in that idol and say my yields are because of him. No, no. Oh, I am Krishna, PGP 2. Thanks. Oh, okay, another Krishna. I hope you are also my admirer, not critic. <laughs> Uh, my question is uh, regarding the second question you answered him. When you said I have two parties, one party saying me, party in the sense my people saying me that uh, I need, I should not go and score on what terrorism did, uh, did and other party saying that uh, no, you, need, you should, uh, should not waste the opportunity. I don't, don't you think as a political party or a politician or a represent, uh, elected representative too, you need to have a point of view where you can say your people, yes, this is the right way, whatever you are thinking is the wrong way. Yes, absolutely. Because like when, when we see any issue in India, we, most of the times what happens is as a political party or the elected member, they don't have a point of view. When if 100 people say that is correct, probably that is how democracy works here. When 100 people say that is correct, then we go that uh, yes, it's correct, even it's wrong. Don't no, you think? Um, no, no, sorry, don't you think what? Don't you think uh, this is a fault? with the democracy or maybe uh, because, because the, uh, it is how the politicians did to the people. See, first thing, uh, somewhere uh, you mentioned that if uh, not one, two, but ten or hundred people say something, you get it. No, that is very important there. Let us not forget that there is both power and magic in public opinion. I am using some great man's word lines here, it is not my original. Public opinion has power, public opinion also has magic. And public opinion is therefore very critical for democracy. So it is not as if I will be committing an error if I go with public opinion. But at the same time, being close to uh, the decision making process or being somebody who has to look into the way in which this country has to be governed, it is my duty being in political party to understand how far this public opinion can go and where it cannot and stop at that and take a position. That is where political parties which expressly state their ideology will be able to translate it and speak for one or the other. Sometimes you may not be getting the popular support, but you do state it. And I therefore here will take the example because it is recent memory of Lokpal debate. The Jan Lokpal bill, as was being presented at that time, the clamor was BJP should support it and get the Jan Lokpal through, right? Our leaders interacted with the people who were talking about Jan Lokpal. All the Anna Hazare, Kiran Bedi, Kejriwal, they interacted with them and very clearly point by point told them, yes, these are very good. But I am sorry, hold on, this aspect cannot be constitutionally framed into the law. So this will not be sustained in parliament. This cannot be enacted by a law. This has to be removed and therefore had a threadbare discussion on Jan Lokpal. And while doing that, we explained as to why we think this way or that. That is the ideology linked putting forward of an idea. And let me tell you here, I was also closely monitoring that election, therefore I will be able to tell you with a certain sense of confidence. Uttarakhand government, well before the elections in December 2011 for the state assembly, under the leadership and chief ministership of General Kanduri, had passed exact almost ditto copy of the Jan Lokpal as Jan Lok Adalat in Uttarakhand state. He had also added a few more legislations like the Seva Guarantee Bill, whereby you go to a state government minister, department and ask for some kind of a service. They don't do it within 30 days, they'll be pulled up. Next, if they don't finish it in the next 10 days, they'll be the, the particular official salary will be taken off. Whatever, it has a punitive you know, uh, link at every stage when there is a failure. 
I will give you a cynical answer now. Uttarakhand BJP lost the election. The clamor in the country was for a Jan Lokpal. Here is a state government which did to did the Lok Adalat, which is what the uh, you know Aam Admi was wanting and asking for. So does that mean the public opinion, which was standing out and screaming, saying everything in this country is going to be sorted out if only you had Lokpal and Lok Adalat, the way in which it has been drafted by the you know agitating public? Why did we lose the election in Uttarakhand? And why did we, I am not taking names, allow a corrupt government to come into Uttarakhand again? I don't know. So that's one. In the center, in the center, the discussions were going on. I told you with the people and looked at every bit of, you know, the Jen uh, Lokpal bill. Every bit, every clause was discussed and hydrated for what is permissible under constitution, what can be accommodated in the parliament, what will be looked at by the standing committee. Till today, it is not passed. And all of us know the drama which happened in Raj Sabha. It's sort of diluted now. We wish the bill passes and we'll give our cooperation for it. But does that shake the central government? Have the people of India then questioned with the same way you've thrown out a government which gave you the Jan Loka Dalat? Uh, 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 Loka da, uh, did, you, did you manage to even shake the government which has not given you a Jan Lokpa? But questions are asked. As an opposition party, did you do a fair deal of working uh, with the, the Jan Lokpal agitators? We've been giving our best of times. No, BJP doesn't seem to be rising. I'm so puzzled by these kind of observations. The government which has to give us the bill is not even talking about it. It's diluting it. It's messing it up. Some alliance partner even tears up the bill in the Raj Sabha. We are kind. Uh, that's how, you know, that's how they work. Whereas BJP can't do this. I'm glad that kind of an expectation lever being raised about BJP. But that's the, you know, how far do you therefore take the public opinion? We have to work with it. As I said, it has the power, it has the magic, we have to work with it. Okay, we have to close here. Thank you very much for all the questions. Yeah, so I conclude by thanking all of you all. It's been a very enriching experience for me. Thanks very much. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your rich experience and answering our questions. I now invite Dr. Ramdas M. Pai to present a memento to our chief guest, Srimati Nirmala Sita Raman. Thank you, sir. To bring this leadership lecture to a close, I would like to call Professor Aparna Bhatt to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, Dipanshu. Honorable Chairperson Padma Bhushan Awardee Dr. Ram Das Pai, respected orator of the day Srimati Nirmala Sitaraman, the guest of honor Dr. K. Ram Narayan, our most valued invited dignitaries and guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on the occasion of the 13th Leadership Lecture. I, on behalf of TAPNI Fraternity and on my own behalf, extend a very hearty gratitude to Dr. Ramdas Pai for presiding over the 13th Leadership Lecture. <laughs> I wish to place on record a hearty thanks to Dr. K. Ram Narayan Vice Chancellor Manipal University for taking us through the history of the leadership lectures. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for Srimati Nirmala Sitaraman for giving an excellent coverage to the topic Does India Need Good Politicians or Good politics, Political Parties? I am certain that I can speak for all of us when I say that seldom have I heard this topic presented so clearly and the galore of questions answered with conviction laced with wit. 
To some extent, you have eased our extended dilemma over this issue. A note of gratitude to all our dignitaries of the days who have extended their every support whenever we sought. We very much appreciate your being able to join us today. I also wish to express my gratitude to our director, Dr. R. C. Natarajan, for guiding and encouraging us at the right times. I wish to convey my thanks to the press personalities for the coverage of the event. Also mention has to be made of the fantastic student sorority who are very interactive and exuberant. Thanks for making this lecture a lively one. I extend my gratitude to Mr. Praveen, Mr. Nayak and Mr. Anand Pai and their teams for the perfect IT and logistic support. I cannot thank enough the team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues of TAPME for the enormous cooperation in organizing this event. Well, ladies and gentlemen, an event like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels start rolling weeks ago. It requires planning and running around for details and last moment clinchers. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by our staff who are right there with all solutions to the slightest problems that we faced. Thanks a ton to all of you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for being with us this evening. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much.